know your name, I know you great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just trying to serve, dog, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way. But I know you got me. Ain't no love like you and me. So I was blind, but now I see. Why got all this face on me? Good morning, brothers and sisters. Hi. Such a privilege to, to see you all this morning. I haven't seen you all since last year. Uh, but we, we praise God that uh, he's been faithful to us. We're in 2024, and I'm sure we're all excited about all that God is going to do in our lives. Amen? Today is going to be a very different kind of service. Um, today is what we call a covenant service. And hopefully last week um, on your pews, uh, you took home one of these. Um, you should see it on your pew so it's not too late. And there's some words that we're going to say together. If you, if you call West Croydon Baptist Church your, your family, this is your home church, um, then I'm going to, um, later on, we're going to say these words together uh, to commit ourselves to one another and, and ultimately, ultimately to commit ourselves uh, to God. And this is a, just a way to refresh our minds, to remind us of why we do church, why we meet with brothers and sisters, the importance of fellowship, because it's easy to forget um, over the years. So as we've uh, kicked in into 2024, uh, I've just prayed that we can covenant uh, together. And then later on, I'm going to share a very short uh, sermon, and then we're going to have some time where we're going to be in groups, um, sharing some feedback around the church and also some um, questions that I'm going to pose to every single person here. So it's going to be a very different kind of service, uh, but I do believe that the Lord will continue to speak to us. Amen. Uh, so last week, if you were here for our crossover service, um, if you weren't here, uh, you definitely missed out. It was the greatest service ever. Who was here? Who was there? Amen. Jesus physically came and we had, it was, it was fantastic. You guys, you missed out. You missed out. Um, but I, I was reflecting on Psalm 27 and, and still, uh, this verse has still been on my mind. Psalm 27, um, verse from verse 1, which says, um, speaking of King David, speaking here. One thing that I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Amen. Uh, my hope is that we would really devour this, this passage and live out this passage. I pray that in 2024, uh, in this church, this will be every single person's number one desire, and that is to seek after the Lord. So if you've come here this, this morning seeking after God, uh, the good news is that he is here and he's willing to connect with you, he's willing to speak to you, and he's willing to show you his grace and his mercy. So before we start the service, let's just close our eyes in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day you've given us, Lord. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that even though it's cold, the sun is shining. I thank you, Lord, that despite the weather, despite the storms that we may experience in life, Lord, you are still faithful. Thank you so much, Lord, for bringing um, all of us and as, as a church and as individuals through to 2024. Lord, we have no idea what this year holds, but again, we know that you are good and you are faithful. Uh, help us as a church and as individuals, Lord, to put you as our number one priority this year, Lord. Last week, we looked at your word in Revelations chapter 3 about being a lukewarm Christian. I pray, Lord, that state, that mindset, that way of life, Lord, would completely evaporate from every single person's life in the life of this church, Lord. That we'll be a church that's on fire for you, that's useful for you, Lord. So, God, we give you the service. This is your time. This is an opportunity for us to connect with you. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to do that throughout this service. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Church, if we're able to stand, we're going to worship the Lord through our voices. Uh, so if you're able to stand, let's sing together. Good morning, church. Good morning. It is indeed a privilege for us to meet together the first Sunday of this year. And as we start our time of song worship to our Lord and our Savior, I would hope and pray that the words of our first song particularly would be a prayer for us all. Purify my heart.
Awesome. So we have our week of prayer starting from tomorrow, the 8th, um, and it will finish on the 12th of January. And we're meeting here every, every day at 7.30 to pray. Uh, we really see the importance of prayer. We have different um, topics that we're going to be praying for. The first uh, two days, we're going to be focusing on ourselves a bit, uh, looking at our own personal holiness um, and devotion to God. So, and then uh, throughout the week, we'll be praying for different aspects of the life of the church. So if you're able to, to come, uh, maybe you're really busy and you can only come to one day, uh, please, it will be good if the whole church can really engage in prayer as we start this new year. Uh, just a reminder again for baptism classes, we should be starting baptism classes very soon. Uh, so if you're here and you want to be baptized, uh, please come and speak to either myself or Dapo, and we'll give you more information around baptism classes. I want to shame some people, but put your hands up if you have taken on one of the Bible challenges. Good, quite, quite a lot of people. Brilliant. But it's not the whole church. I, I really want to see the whole church engage with the Bible challenge. So you might see me come up to you with a sheet of paper uh, or asking you what challenge you're doing. I just really want you to engage with the Bible, and maybe your response might be you're already engaging, you already have a plan, fantastic, continue, um, but if you're not um, engaging, and I want to really encourage you to read the Bible within a year, um, so if it's three months, which is, uh, I think two months, sorry, if it's two months, which is extreme, uh, but possible, someone is doing it in the life of our church, um, but if you want to do a year, uh, we have all these plans that you can do, so Come see me after the service. I'll put your name down. I'll give you a hard copy. I can email you um, an electronic copy. And this is just a plan for you to read the Bible within a year. So hopefully the whole church, by the end of next year, uh, we've all would have read the Bible. Um, and if you're doing a six months challenge, maybe you would have um, read the Bible twice in one year. Um, so please, if you're not engaged yet, please do get engaged. Amen? Amen. And, and just a couple of updates. As I, as I mentioned, today's service is going to be very different. Uh, we're having a covenant service. And so if you call West Craven Baptist Church your home, and we're going to make some promises to God and some promises to one another as a church community. I'm going to share a very short sermon, and then we're going to go into groups 
and I'm just trying to get some feedback from us um, um, within some particular topics that I want us to look at and particular themes. And so later on, we're going to go into groups and we're going to share uh, together. But before we do that, I just want to um, share a couple of updates and um, some things coming on uh, in the next um, couple of months. Um, so we have our first theology night. Can we have the first slide? So every month, we're going to look at a piece of theology or a topic. Um, we might look at the sovereignty of God. We might look at the Trinity. We're going to look at maybe more complicated topics that um, we don't necessarily have the time to really dive into. And um, just to give us a bit of background, as, a de as deacons, we've been looking at um, the whole topic of homosexuality. And the reason why we've been looking at that is because the Baptist Union, which we are a part of, are having a big discussion around homosexuality. And this has kind of um, been, a, been a little situation with um, the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church. There's been big discussions over the last three years around homosexuality and how we embrace uh, people who are struggling with homosexuality, but also our stance as a church relating to homosexuality. So sadly, we have a lot of Baptist churches in the Baptist Union who have swayed their position and no longer following the biblical position on homosexuality. And it's been quite cunning how a lot of ministers have been able to sway people with very weak arguments. But because, I've noticed, because a lot of church members don't engage with scriptures or go deeper in the scriptures, they don't know how to counteract these bad arguments. And so I, I thought, um, because the Baptist Union are speaking about this, we thought it would be good for us to have a discussion uh, around um, the whole topic around homosexuality. So on the 26th of January at 7 p.m. here at the church, I'm going to do a, 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 a study on what the Bible teaches about homosexuality, or what the Bible says about homosexuality. So please come with your questions. Uh, please come with your Bibles. We're really going to dig in and look at what does God say about this particular issue. So if you're free, uh, please do come along. Um, I also want to um, uh, give you some good news that from next week, we have a new teaching series that we're looking at. Are you ready for the teaching series? Do you want to know what book it is? Drum roll. The book of John. Hey. So um, the preaching team, we met together, we prayed together. Uh, we had a couple of books that we were really interested in, and, but we thought that as a church, it would be really good for us to dive in and look at who Jesus is, who Jesus is. So we're going to be looking at the book of John uh, from next week. We're going to be looking at the book of John for the whole year. Uh, so come prepared. And um, as we did with the book of Acts, I have these uh, little booklets. It's basically the Bible, but it's got notes inside. Um, so I know some people like coming to church with their big Bibles, or some people like coming to church with their phones, and they sometimes get distracted. But if you come to church with this, you can take your notes on this. You can scribble on stuff. Um, cool, no worries. <laughs> She's just telling me that she wants one, but yeah, cool, no problem. Um, and you can, you can um, take this. These are only five pounds, um, really accessible, and I'm planning to order more um, very soon. But I'm going to be really nice today because the sun is out, even though it's cold. I'm going to give a free copy to someone. You, Samantha, you did put your hand up first. I think you're, you're really tall, so your hand is, I can just see it from all the way back. So please come and get a copy uh, when you're free. Awesome. If we can go to our covenants. So I'm going to uh, invite the, just the spark. Sparklers, I said sprinklers last week, so I'm trying to, trying to remember. The sparklers to go to your classes, so that's um, from three to five? Three to six. Um, but the older group are staying in the service. And um, the reason why the older group are staying in the service is, is because we don't actually have the volunteers to teach them. And so I just want to share another appeal um, to really help Roy and the team. If you're here and you're willing to serve and help with the children's ministry, uh, please uh, do let them know. Thank you. Okay. So the covenant slides, please. So church, we're going to covenant with one another. And so I'm going to ask all of us to stand. And hopefully you can all see the words. So if you stop there, oops, nope, 
go to the Bible passage. Awesome. Um, so I've really been praying about a verse for us to kind of memorize and to take on as a church community, especially as we look at the book of John. So when you came in, hopefully you received one of these. It has the passage from 1 John uh, chapter 12. Hopefully the whole year you can memorize this passage and understand the truth of what God is saying in this particular verse. Uh, take it home, put it on your fridge, memorize it. Um, this is our passage for the year. So it's uh, John chapter 1 verse 12. And um, the writer John says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Amen. Next slide. Next slide. Cool. So we're going to start with our personal uh, covenant. So next slide. So um, if you're able to, if you just quickly read these words, and then we're going to commit these words to the Lord uh, together. So I'll give you a few seconds. If you believe these words, let's share these words together. Let's go. Lord, I commit to seeking you this year. I will seek you to know you more through your inerrant word. I will commit to seek you first above anything else. Next slide. Lord, I commit to loving you more this year. I will seek to love you with all of my heart, soul, and mind. Next one. Lord, I commit to serving you this year. I will be a laborer in your harvest field. Okay. Amen. So we're going to our church covenant now. So again, if you call West Credit Baptist Church your home, uh, please let's say these words together. Let's go. I will worship the one true God with other West Credit Baptist Church members for as long as I am physically able. I will grow spiritually through regular involvement in groups and in classes of West Credit Baptist Church. I will serve Christ through the mission work of West Credit Baptist Church. I will give abundantly universally and to others as well. I will seek unity with other church members. I recognize God's plan for the church is unity and diversity, and I will put the interests of others above my personal preferences. I will pray for and follow the leadership of West Fred and Baxter's church. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. One of the ones that I forgot to uh, put on there was that I would um, seek to bake Pastor Denzel fresh cakes <laughs> every Sunday, but I think... Patricia must have missed that out of. Anyways, let's go into God's word. Do we have our Bibles with us? Or did we leave it in 2023? If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. If you dare say amen. <clears throat> amen. God's word says this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I, I need your help this morning to, to preach your word, Lord. Um, even though this is a, a very short uh, message, 
I just pray, Lord, that you will really speak to us as a church community this morning. Uh, Let your word just run rapid through our minds and our hearts. I pray that we will not just hear these words, Lord, but we will do these words. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, So church, just for a few moments, I just want you to imagine something with me. Um, I want you to imagine that somehow one of our members from this church um, came and they said that they have concrete information, validated information from heaven itself that Jesus is coming in the first week of February 2024. Like, this is valid information. One of our members, I'm not going to name who they are, uh, they've had a conversation with God and, they, and they've come and it's, it's, it's true. Jesus is coming back. His second coming, he's coming back in the first week of February. Now, I wonder how we will start behaving as a church if we really understand or we really believe that Jesus is coming in the first week of February. I wonder how we will start behaving as a church community with this confirmed information that Jesus is 100% coming in the first week of February. I wonder how we will behave. Because as Christians, we know that Jesus, in his word, he talks about coming back, but he's not just coming back for a random few. He's not just, he's not just coming back for the rich and the wealthy. He's not just coming back for nice people. He's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for people who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm still baffled and confused to why there's still so many Christians that don't see the value of church, that don't see the importance and the glory of church when Jesus says he's coming back for his church. But I wonder how we will start behaving. I have a feeling that as a church, as West Crater Baptist Church, I have a feeling that if we have this concrete information that Jesus is coming back in the first week of February, I think we're going to start loving people better. I think we're going to start treating people better. In fact, I think we're going to start loving people that we don't really like in church. We're going to start serving more. We might even start giving to the church more. We might even be more committed to God. We might even start reading our Bible. Our, our Bibles will no longer be dusty. But we're going to start reading the Bible because we know that Jesus is coming back in the first week of February. I have a feeling that in a space of one month, we would become the healthiest committed church in the country because Jesus is coming back. Now, even though I'm, I'm telling us to imagine, in reality, as Christians and as a church, we really should be living life and doing church like it's our last Sunday. We should be treating each other and doing church today like it's our last Sunday. We should be living life as Christians like it's our last day on earth. And I'm not saying this to make us fearful, but I'm saying that we don't know when Jesus will come back. We have no idea when Jesus will come back. And that's why in the Gospels, Jesus speaks a lot about preparing yourself. There's so many parables that Jesus shares with these people, telling them to be ready, be prepared, because you have no idea when I'm coming back. Please turn to your neighbor and say, be prepared. Be prepared. You see, growing up, um, my mother, I've mentioned this before, my mom, she had two jobs. She worked really hard. And often when she came back, when I came back from school, she'll be ready going back um, to work, to her second job. So sometimes I wouldn't even see her if I had detention and and so on. I wouldn't see her. Uh, She'll be off to work. And she'll she'll come around around 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And during that time, between the time that I get back from from school and uh, the time that she comes back, literally between that time, I'm doing whatever I want. I have friends over. uh, I beat up my brother. I eat what I want to eat, I do what I want to do, I watch what I want to watch. But when it starts getting closer to 8 o'clock, I start tidying up the house. I sit by my desk to do my homework, to make it seem like I'm a really good child. I I make sure my brother's still not crying. (laughs) And everything is good. But I'll never forget the day that she decided to come home at 5 o'clock. 
It said of eight o'clock and the house was a mess. My brother was in tears. And let's just say both me and my brother went to bed crying that <laughs> night. I wasn't prepared. We must be prepared. See, there is a way that we must live knowing that we don't know when Jesus is coming back. There's a way that we must do church knowing that we don't know when Jesus is coming back. So the question is, how should we do church? Well, Peter makes it very clear for us in this passage today. He's speaking to a couple of churches around Asia Minor, and he's speaking to them about what a church must do in the last days. So he says, the end of all things is near. He's talking about something that we refer to as the last days, the last days, the end times, the last days. And when people hear these words, the last days, often Christians start panicking because a lot of Christians have watched that movie Left Behind. Anyone watch that movie Left Behind? Uh, no one, a few people, but it's a movie that has a really false mindset of what the last days is, is going to look like. It's going to look disastrous. But simply, the last days is simply the, the moment that Jesus resurrected, ascended up to heaven, and waiting for his second coming. So in between that period, from the time that Jesus went to heaven, and obviously in the book of Revelations, he's promised he's coming back again, between that time is considered the last days. So we as a church, we are living in the last days because we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? But the thing is, we just don't know when that day is. There are many denominations, I know the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, I think over the years they've tried to uh, predict when Jesus, was, when Jesus will come back. I remember when I was in school, I was told that in 2012, uh, Jesus uh, was going to come back, was going to be the end of the world. Again, we're in 2024 now, so obviously that didn't happen. But it's, it's, there's going to be more of these predictions coming. But in reality, nobody knows the day when Jesus will come back. But we're living in the last days. So Peter tells this church, because you're living in the last days, there are some things that you must do. These are some things that you must do. And he lists three things that we must do as a church. Uh, Peter's not just talking to one individual. He's speaking to the whole church. And because we're living in the last days, he's speaking to us today. So church, do you, do you want to know what these three things are? Yeah. One person, that's great. When you're living in the last days as a church, you must pray more. If you like taking notes, write that down. We must pray more. Listen to what Peter says. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. So because we don't know when Jesus is coming back, we must be alert and sober-minded in order for us to pray. Because if we're not alert and sober-minded, then we will never, ever have that intentional time to pray. And that's where things always go pear-shaped in our lives, and we're not close to God through prayer. And I find it very interesting that Peter is the one writing these, these words. Because remember in the Gospels, in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember, remember when Jesus was about to be crucified, when Jesus was going through that horrific moment, what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? He said they must be alert and pray, watch and pray. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Peter seems to have learned from his experiences, and he urges the church, be alert, be sober-minded, and pray. Because if their minds are occupied by other things, then they will never spend time to pray. And if your minds are not alert, then you will not see false teaching when they come. You will not see the enemy working when he comes. You'll be swept away by many lies and deceptive teaching in our world today when you're not alert and when you do not pray. They must pray because prayer helps them to stay closer to God. Prayer helps them to see clearly. Uh, prayer helps them to get through the persecution that they were enduring. Prayer helps them to depend on God. And because we're living in the last days, our prayers must be urgent. It must be a different kind of prayer. Our prayers must be intentional. We must pray for the lost. We must pray that our sin, we can see our sin and repent. We must pray that we don't lose focus and become worldly. We must pray to have more communion with God. We must pray. Amen? How does a, a church living in the last days prepare themselves for Jesus? They must be alert and they must pray. 
Watch your life. Watch your doctrine and pray. When we see evil rising up in this world, we must pray. When we see more false teachers rising up in our world, we must pray. When we see sin working and, and being prevalent in the life of the church, we must pray. Amen. So we must pray more. The second thing he says that we must love more. Turn to the person next to you and say, I love you. Hopefully that wasn't too awkward. We must love more. Listen to what Peter says. Above all, above all, love each other deeply because love covers, covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Amen. See, the words above all means that whatever Peter's about to say is very important. This is something that you should place as, as the highest um, priority. Above all, love more. He talks about loving each other deeply. Loving each other deeply. And, and notice who Peter is speaking to. He's not speaking to husbands, commanding them to love their wives more, which of course they should. He's not speaking to parents, telling them to love their children more, which of course they should. But he's speaking to the church. And the reason why I feel like it's important for me to highlight that is because maybe there might be some people in this room who don't believe we're called to love each other deeply. We're called to smile at each other. Uh, we're called to sit next to each other. We're called to tolerate each other. But to love deeply? No, I don't think we're called to do that. Well, you have to wrestle with this text if you don't believe that because Peter is telling this church to love each other deeply. Why, why should we love each other deeply? There are many reasons, but Peter gives one clear reason. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Very interesting. And it's true. If you think about it, where, where, where is sin in our church? Where do we see sin in our church? Or, or maybe the better question is, who commits the sin in our church? It's not the pews that commit sin. It's not the the lights that commit sin. It's not the doors that commit sin. It's not the stage that commits sin. It's the people of God that commit sin. And where we see more sin in the life of the church is where we see a lack of love. But if we deeply love each other, then we will see less sin in the church. Amen? Because if we really love each other deeply, then we won't gossip about one another. We won't speak ill of one another. We won't be jealous of one another. We won't hurt one another. Rather, if we deeply love each other, we would be quick to forgive. Someone might step on your new trainers, and you would quickly forgive them. But honestly, you would forgive quicker if you deeply love one another. You will put the interest of others before yours. You will pray for one another. You will carry each other's burdens. Listen to what a, a well-known theologian, Wayne Grudem, says about this passage concerning love. He says, where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses, even some large ones, are readily overlooked and forgotten. But where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion, every action is uh, reliable to misunderstanding, and conflict abound to Satan's delight. If we deeply love each other, then we will see less sin in the life of the church. Amen? So we're called to love one another. We're not called to, to tell people alone that we love them. That's not what Peter is saying. He's not saying go around and just tell people that you love them more. He's saying, no, you need to demonstrate this love. That's why he, he says in verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. The expression of our love to one another should be to offer hospitality. And this is what Peter was seeing in his day. Remember in the book of Acts, people were selling their properties and offer in order to offer hospitality to one another. People would open up their homes in order to offer hospitality to one another. And that's my prayer for us in 2024, that we will see more homes being opened for people to come and receive hospitality. I want to see more hands open to offer hospitality and help to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Can we do that, church? Amen. Amen. 
This is what we should see in the life of the church. But the hospitality that we must give must be a genuine hospitality. We shouldn't offer hospitality with grumbling, as Peter says. We shouldn't offer hospitality in order for us to be seen, to see how good we are. We shouldn't offer hospitality to just the people that we like, or maybe the people that look like us. We shouldn't offer hospitality for some sort of self-gain. An end-time church loves more. Amen. And lastly, an end-time church, they serve more. Listen to what Peter says. He says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do with the strength of God that provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So this passage implies that every single person here, if you call yourself a Christian, if you have received the Holy Spirit, you have a gift that God has given you to use to serve his church. Every single person here, there is no person here who is lacking in a gift that Christ has not given. Every single person who's a Christian has this gift. And these spiritual gifts were not earned. It wasn't anything that you did to receive these gifts. They weren't pursued. You didn't work hard to receive these gifts. These gifts were sovereignly given to us by Jesus. And some of these gifts, if you have time, read Romans uh, 12 or read 1 Corinthians 12. And Paul, he lists out what some of these gifts are. I don't have the time to go into it. But some of these gifts are um, the gift of discernment, the gift of evangelism, the gift of exaltation, the gift of faith, the gift of giving, the gift of healing, the gift of hospitality, and you, the list goes on. Every single person has some sort of gift. We all don't have the same gift, but we all have a gift that Christ has given us to use to serve his church. And because these gifts has been given to us by Jesus, he's also given us instructions about how to use these gifts. And it's not for self-gain. It's not for self-glorification. These gifts are used to build up his church. Amen? So Peter, he distinguishes between two gifts. The speaking gifts, which are the gift of preaching, the gift of um, teaching, and he talks about the serving gifts, which are the gift of hospitality or the gift of administration. And both of these gifts are good, they're important, and they both should be used to glorify God. So whenever you see someone come on stage and they're showing off their gifts that God has given them in a way that's not godly, in a way to puff them up, they are abusing the gift that Christ has given them. The way that we glorify God through the gifts that he's given us is by using them to serve others. Now, there might be some people here who, who might say that, Denzel, well, I, I don't know my gift. I don't know my gift. Help me know my gift. Tell me what my gift is so that I can use it to glorify God. And I, I, it's, it's, it's a really good question, and I've, I've heard a couple of responses to that question. I think a lot of people would might encourage you to, to do a spiritual gift test. I think a lot of these uh, tests are online. You can go online and basically it will, it will ask you a couple of questions. You answer these questions and at the end of the test, it will tell you what your spiritual gift is. I've never used those um, platforms before. Uh, I don't know how helpful they are. But my simple advice is, if you don't know what your gift is, my simple advice to you is just serve anyways. Find somewhere to serve. So, find something to do in the church and you would know what your gift is. Because the, the reason why I say that is because, because God is looking for more people who have a heart to serve rather than a heart just to receive a gift to be seen and to be to used for their own glory. Because what good is it if God gives you a gift but you have no heart to serve? You will just get this gift and sit on this gift or get this gift and abuse this gift. God is looking for more people who have the heart to serve. So if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, just Find something to do in the church. And let me tell you, in West Craven Baptist Church, there is a lot of things to do. If you don't know what to do, please come and speak to me, come speak to the deacons, and I can bring out my long list, and I can show you. But that's the way you're going to know your gift. I did not know that God had called me to preach. I didn't know I had that gift to, to pastor in this way. 
Maybe some people still don't think I have this gift, but that's a whole other story. All I, all I started doing was serving, just serving, and the Lord started to reveal more passion, uh, more excitement for certain things, and so I just really um, honed into those particular things that I had a particular interest in. So if you don't know what your gift is, come and serve. Do something in the life of this church. We're all called to serve God in this end time church. Amen? So I'm going to stop there. I did say it was going to be a very short sermon because we're going to come together in groups. Uh, and I want us to talk more about this and look at practically um, how can I really better myself with these three things on praying more, on, on loving more, and serving more. So I want us, and this is where things get a bit chaotic, uh, to split up into groups. Uh, maybe it might be easier just for within this pew here, maybe have three groups, just uh, organize yourself into three groups for all adults here. Uh, and this uh, pew, maybe just organize yourself into two groups. And then this uh, section here, organize yourself into three groups. I'll give us a couple of minutes, uh, hopefully not too long for us to do that quickly. And I'll give you instructions once we're there.
be gracious to you, Lord, turn heed.